Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. How you doing? Good. Welcome to the bridge. So glad that you're here today. My name is Vince. I'm the lead pastor here. Thanks for being with us. If you're new, especially thank you for giving church a chance, coming, sitting in a row with all these crazy people. This loud music. You're like, what is going on? We're so glad that you are here today. We're glad if you're watching online. We're glad um, if you're even watching this later in the week. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are in part four of a five-part series. On the count of three, say it with me. One, two, three. Through the Valley. The name of the series is Through the Valley, and it's all about how to get through the valley seasons of life. Not the mountaintops, but the valleys, the trials, the pain, the difficulty, the anxiety, the frustration. How do we make it through the valley? Every single one of us goes through a valley at one point or another. Even if you've given your life to Jesus, he does not promise that you will be um, rescued from every trial. Jesus said, the, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the, the world. That's exactly right. If you haven't been here, let me catch you up um, real quick on what we've been talking about. We've been looking at the life of a guy named David. Everyone say David. David was, many of you know, the giant killer, killed Goliath, first good king of Israel. He had some high points, but he also had even more low points. This is my best attempt to sketch the low times of David's life. That's what we're looking at in this series, the valley moments of David's life. Not only are we, not only are we looking at those stories, however, we are also looking at the Psalms that David wrote about how he faced those valley moments. Moments. The Psalms were basically like journal entries, songs, poems, things that David wrote when he was facing the valley. And as we're learning how David faced the valley, we're also learning how we can face the valley as well. So far, we've seen David in an. One more time. We've seen David in an unexpected valley. We've seen David in an. We've seen David in an. We also call that the unreasonable valley. And today. We are seeing David not in an unfair valley, but in a not unfair valley. Here's what all these previous valleys have in common. None of them were really David's fault. The unexpected valley wasn't his fault. He had it all and he lost it all and he didn't do anything wrong. The unending valley was not his fault. It was because Saul was trying to kill him and kill him and kill him. The unfair valley obviously was not his fault. But today we're going to jump to here and we're going to see David in a valley that was the natural and in, in a really in a lot of ways, divine consequences for his own sin. Some of you are here today in a not unfair valley. If you're honest with yourself, you know that decisions you've made, choices you've made, paths you've gone down have brought you to the hardship that you're facing today. And I want you to know I get it. I've been there many times. My senior year of high school, I was going to church. I was doing the church thing. I was part of the youth group. I also had a girlfriend from school that I was sleeping with. And God's word says that sex should be saved until marriage. And I was like, I don't care about that. I'm going to do my own thing. And for a while, it did not lead me into a valley. But freshman year of college, when she broke up with me for another guy, that sent me down the darkest valley I had been through at that time, depression, frustration, lots of insecurity that I hadn't experienced before, a sexual addiction. And obviously I wasn't the only person involved in that equation. But if I had chosen to follow God's commandment to wait until sex or wait until marriage for sex, that breakup would have been a lot less painful. That valley would have been not nearly as deep. That was the first person I had ever slept with, and it was so dark of a valley because of the decisions I had made. So I don't want you to hear me up here and say, oh, well, he's never made any mistakes or done any bad things. No, I've been there. I've experienced going through a valley because of my own decisions. And just like you, I wanted to rationalize it all away. It wasn't really my fault. I got led into temptation. I didn't know any better, but the reality is I did. Some of you are in a place right now that if you get really honest with yourself, the divorce was not all the other person's fault, right? As much as you say, oh, it was all them. No, part of it was you. And part of the fact that you're in a valley right now was a decision or decisions that you made. That broken friendship or broken relationship or the fact that you got dumped, you weren't the only person in that equation, but you were one of the people 
in that equation. Maybe uh, you're facing financial difficulty. You've got some debt or you haven't been promoted in the way that you hoped at your job. And you can blame it all on the boss or blame it all on the spouse or blame it all on the credit cards. But the reality is you were a part of that equation. Depression and anxiety, we believe, is not necessarily at all caused by sin, but some of you haven't taken your mental health seriously and you haven't taken the steps that you need to. And the depression or anxiety isn't your fault, but it's been your responsibility and just been pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off. I'm not going to deal with that. I don't need to deal with that, etc. Some of you have been battling an addiction and an addiction... I believe on some level is a disease, but you are still a part of the equation. You're part of the reason that you've wrestled with that thing. And today is all about how do we deal with the moment when we realize I'm part of the reason. I'm part of the cause. I'm part of the fact that I'm dealing with the valley because of the choices I've made. Every other valley has been not your fault. And that's been nice for you a lot of these weeks. You're like, yes, we're, we're not talking about the part I've had to play in this. But what about the part that you've had to play in the valley that you're in? That's what we are talking about today. We are going to look at David's valley. We're going to look at Psalm 51, which is what he wrote about the valley he was facing. And then we're going to talk about what that looks for our lives. Let me catch everybody up from what's gone on from this point until the episode we're going to see today. We're going to do like a two to three minute flyover of David's life. Then we're going to look at the episode. Then we're going to look at the psalm. If you're ready, say I'm ready. Some of you are like, I was ready until we realized what it was going to be about today. Now I'm less ready. I want you to get up off my back already. But listen, this, this is because I love you and God loves you and because he has endless grace. The worst thing that we can do when we've gotten ourselves into a valley is to blame it on everybody else, to bury those feelings of guilt. It is only by working through the guilt, through the shame, that we end up coming out on the other side, the person that God intends for us to be. Amen? All right, so here's what's going on in David's story from the beginning until the episode that we see today. For some of you, this is going to be a review, but if you're here for the first time, this will be the first time you've heard this. We're starting right down here, and you can watch this line travel through his ups and downs as I summarize. David started as the forgotten child in a big family. Nobody really liked him. Nobody really cared about him. That all changed when a guy named Samuel showed up one day and said, this kid, this random youngest child in this family is going to be the future king of Israel. It would have been easy to write it off and say, no, that prophet was some old kooky guy out of his mind. But shortly after this, David kills Israel's literally biggest enemy, a guy named Goliath. Everyone say Goliath. King Saul, the first king of Israel, takes notice of David's handiwork with the sling and enlists David to be in his army. David becomes the most powerful military general that God's people, the people of Israel, have ever seen. People writing songs about him. He's getting more and more famous, and he ends up marrying Saul's daughter, Michal. Everyone say Michal. Saul at some point goes, wait a minute. I don't like all the attention this guy is getting. i got to put him in his place. I'm going to try to kill him. I'm worried that he's going to try to take over the throne before I die, so I'm going to kill David. He sends assassins to David's house, and David has to go on the run for a long time. Now, one detail I'm going to tell you right now that we haven't told in previous weeks, but it's going to tie into what we're talking about today. During this time, Saul gave Michal to another man. She had been left at home while David was running for his life, and Saul gave Michal to some other guy. David is on the run for years and years and years, and Saul is spending less and less time focusing on his duties as a king to the point that I believe it actually started causing some uh, weakness in the empire. And one day when the Philistines, the enemies of God's people, are attacking the Israelites, God's people, Saul realizes he's about to lose the particular battle that he's fighting, and he kills himself. He falls on his own sword. At this point, David was God's next man to be king. He was the chosen replacement for Saul, but Saul's military general ends up putting Saul's son Ishbosheth in charge. Everyone say Ishbosheth. That's a fun one to say. Ishbosheth and Saul's army goes to war against David and his army, which as time goes on is growing and growing and growing. More and more people are giving their allegiance to David, more and more of God's people, and Ishbosheth is losing power. And this goes on and on and on until David is finally king. This leads us to the second high point of David's life. 
this would have been a great time for David to walk with the Lord. It would have been a great time for him to be faithful. Isn't that true for me and you as well? That it's always like we look back and we go, why did I make those decisions? I was fine. I was in a good place and I spiraled myself down. The same thing is true for David. Here's what happens. This is now the episode where he makes the worst decisions, I believe, of his life. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. This was my best attempt to try to draw like a terrace. What do you guys think? It's okay, right? So he's on the roof, his terrace of his palace, and he's looking across the little neighborhood that his palace is in, and he sees a roof across the way, and here's what he sees. From the roof, he saw a woman, everybody say that word. Now some of you, if you know this story, you're going to go, how are we going to do the nude scene in church? How's this going to go? Because we always have, we try to have pictures up here of the characters as they happen, so people are like getting ready to shield their eyes, right? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep it censored. You all see that? We got a little shower curtain. Bathsheba's behind there. This is the edited version for church, obviously. Come on. But this was no, there was no shower curtain at the time. She is bathing on that roof, and David sees her. The woman was very beautiful. So the next morning, David gets one of his servants and says, I want you to go find out who lives in that house. He's never met this woman before. He knows nothing about her. David sent someone to find out about her. The guy goes and comes back and reports. He says, the the man says she is, everyone say that word? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. It is a total coincidence that bath in English is in her name, I think, unless the word bath came from her name. I have no idea. Y'all fact check me on that. But her name is Bathsheba, which at the time had nothing to do with bath, I think. I don't know. You guys can look it up. I don't know. Anyways, anyways, anyways. The man says she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the, everyone say that word? Wife of Uriah the Hittite. Emphasis on wife. Emphasis on somebody else's wife. And Uriah the Hittite was one of the most faithful of all David's soldiers. This is David's crossroads where he's going to go, okay, I've seen this woman. I want this woman, but she's the wife of one of my men. What do I do? Now, the language that describes what happens next is very vague. It is very hard to tell if what happened next was consensual or whether it was David taking advantage or even raping Bathsheba. Look what happens. Then David sent messengers to get her. These messengers were likely armed. Bathsheba goes with them. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, there has been pages and pages written about what, whether or not this was consensual. Did Bathsheba tempt David into this by bathing on the roof? Did David take advantage of her? Based on what happens next that you're about to see, I believe that this was, at the very best, a total coercion on David's part. When you're a king and you send armed guards to a woman's house that you've never met and say, bring her to my chamber, there's not a lot of choice the woman has in the matter. That was the very best version of it. At the very worst, this could have been a rape, a complete rape, and the prophet who shows up in a minute places all the blame on David. He slept with her and then he sent her home. Then she went back home. Now the the worst news for David was this. The woman conceived. She gets pregnant from their sexual encounter and sent word to David. She sends David a note and the note says saying, I am pregnant. Now David goes, okay, I'm in trouble now. So he sends for Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, from the front lines and says, come on home, spend some time with your wife, hoping that Uriah will sleep with Bathsheba, Bathsheba will get pregnant, or uh, Bathsheba, it'll be thought that Bathsheba got pregnant from Uriah. But Uriah is so faithful, he goes, I'm not going to go home and make love to my wife when all my comrades, my brothers are on the front line of battle and he actually sleeps in front of the temple. So the next night... David takes it up another notch, tries to get Uriah drunk, gets him drunk, and Uriah still does the same thing. 
And David, out of desperation and a drive to not be found out, sends Uriah to the front line of battle and then commands his own general to back out right when the fighting is fiercest to get Uriah killed. And Uriah is struck down. So now David has this sexual assault, and now he's committed murder of one of his best soldiers. He brings Bathsheba to him, marries her, and makes her a queen in the land. And at this point, just like so many of us, he probably is going, I got away with it. This will be fine. No one knew. No one saw. God hasn't really seen. I'm just going to wrap this up, put a tie bow on it, and it will become a part of my past, and no one has to know until a guy named Nathan shows up, prophet. God has told Nathan what David did. And Nathan gets David's attention in one of the most crazy, powerful ways ever. He says, David, i got to tell you um, a news story that just happened in our kingdom. He says, hey, there were two men in a certain town in our kingdom. And he tells this story like it's a true story, even though it's not. But he tells it to David like it's a true story. He says, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. Now, this sounds a little weird, like that's a lot of love for a little lamb. i got to tell you, I've seen some of those cat videos on Facebook. I saw some this week where some person has their cat, like, in their food, and they're eating the food. Really gross. So there's precedent for this. And David believes this is a true story, that this guy just loves this lamb. The lamb has slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. This poor guy loves this lamb. Then Nathan goes on and says, Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. The rich guy says, i got to make some food for my guest. Whose lamb should I kill? And what does he do? Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it, meaning prepared it for the one who had come to him. That lamb turned into lamb chops. David burned with anger against the man. So he hears this story, and David, in so much denial, so much justifying, so much explaining, he's buried his guilt so far down, he doesn't even realize this story is about him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. And then the prophet responds with four of the most brutal words in the Bible. David says, he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, and read this with me, you are the man. You are that man. Now some of you are like, I was prepared to feel guilty for my own valley, but after hearing what David did, I'm feeling a little better. Not nearly as bad as what I've done. And on some level, there's, there's, there's good news in for that. What you've done is not the worst thing ever. And this guy who's called a man after God's own heart did some of the worst things that we can do to each other as people, right? Sexual assault and murder. But I know that for all of you, there is a time where you feel like if I were to admit to God or to myself what I did or how I feel about what I did, no one would forgive me. No one would love me. What I've done is worse than what anybody else has ever done. We say, yeah, maybe it's not as bad as some people, but I know better, and so my sin is so ugly. It's so horrible. It's just like that. It's just like David. There's a part of all of you that you hear this story, and you go, yeah, that's kind of me. That's kind of me. I did some things. I've done some things. I knew better. I tried to cover it up. I tried to bury it. But at the end of the day, I know I'm that man or I'm that woman. I'm that person. What do we do when we're in that valley of guilt and shame? And we know we got ourselves there. That's where we're going next. David replied to Nathan and said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then he wrote Psalm 51. It feels a little weird for some of us to read a psalm written by a guy like that. 
We're like, I don't want to hear what he had to say. But the reality is we believe as Christians that even though David was the worst, God still had a plan for his life. And he still used David as David repented for his sin and he repented by writing Psalm 51. We believe that psalm is inspired by God to give hope to every single one of us that no matter what we've done, there is a way out. So that's where we're going now, to Psalm 51. As we work through this psalm, just like we've done every week, we're going to see something to say, a truth to say. When you're in a valley, that's really not so unfair that you're facing it. Something to pray when you're in that valley and something to do when you're in that valley. Are you ready to hear what to say in the not unfair valley? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Here's what David teaches us to say. My sin runs deep. God's grace runs deeper. My sin runs deep, but God's grace runs deeper. Here's why this is so important. When we sin, this is what we try to do. We try to say if we have this much sin, we try to shrink it down. If our sin goes real deep, we try to make it seem as shallow as we possibly can to ourselves, to other people, and to God. And then we, once we've shrunk it down, we bring just a little bit of guilt and sin over to God if we believe in God, and say, I just need a little bit of grace. Can you help me out on that? Don't we do that? I sinned just a little bit. Can I have just a little bit of grace? That mindset will destroy you. It will send you down a path of failure after failure after failure, and for some of you, depression and anxiety and suffering because you are not dealing with the depth of the problem. And we are about to see that the depth of God's grace will always be deep enough for whatever mess you have gotten yourself into. My sin runs deep, but God's grace, no matter what you've done, runs deeper. Here's what David says. He says, have mercy on me, O God. Forgive me. Wash away this sin, not because it's small, but according to your unfailing love. Do this in your seat. Start making this motion right here. Just make a little bit. Yes. Unfailing love. Love. He goes on. According to your great compassion. One more time. It's big. It's a lot of compassion. David says, I'm not banking on my sin being small. I'm banking on your compassion being great. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He calls it iniquity. He calls it sin. And then he takes it to another level. Now flipping over to the sin thing, he does the same thing with his sin. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is, everyone say that word, evil in your sight. Now, on some level, that might sound like he's shrinking it down. Like, I didn't really sin against Bathsheba or Uriah. I just sinned against God. That's not what's going on here. Let me tell you this. When he says, I've sinned against you, God, he's saying, this is bigger than somebody might think. If I go out to the lobby after the service and somebody slaps me in the face, am I going to be frustrated? Probably, right? If I go out in the lobby and I see somebody slap Joanna in the face, my wife, am I going to be more or less frustrated? Way more, right? I'm not going to go, well, that was a sin against my wife, so it's not really a sin against me. No, that's, that's going to be way more frustration producing because that's my wife. That's what David is saying. He's saying, when I took advantage of this woman, God, I sinned against you by taking advantage of one of your daughters, one of your children. When I killed this man, I didn't just kill a man. I killed one of your sons. I have not just sinned against people. I've sinned against the holy God of the universe. Do you guys hear like thunder or something in the background? That's the Lord. That's the Lord. I don't really know if it's him. But y'all got to know, we follow a holy God. And when you say, oh, it was just my husband, it was just my friend, it was just my wife, it was just this kid, and people have done way worse to me, and parents did, my parents did way worse to me, and my, this spouse did way worse than I did. No, 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 no. You got to follow David's example and say, my sin runs deep. I've sinned against a holy God against you and you only have sinned. No matter what that person did to you, no matter how much maybe some of it was their fault, no matter how you say, yeah, it wasn't really my thing. No, 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 no. The grace of God is enough. Do not shrink that down. You will miss the grace of God if you shrink your sin down. You got to say, no, my sin runs deep, but God's grace runs deeper. 
And you can't blame it on the circumstance. you got to say, no, that was in me. That sin was in me. That's what David says next. I'm going to skip with him. He goes right here. He says, surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So often we make the excuse like, well, if God made me, then he made me with all this sin. David says, no, 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 no. I've been sinful since birth, and since birth and even before, God's been trying to straighten me out. He says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness in the womb. When I was embryo, David, you started working on straightening me out. You taught me wisdom in that secret place, my mother's womb. If you ever want to experience grace, you have to say, this sin thing is in me. It's deep in there. I'm not going to blame it on the circumstances. I'm not going to blame it on the other person. My sin runs deep. But God's grace runs deeper. He could have made some excuses. He could have said, well, what was she doing naked on the roof? He could have said, well, the previous king took my wife, and so I'm just taking somebody else's wife. I'm treating other people as I have been treated. He could have said, the previous king was trying to kill me, an innocent man, and killed a whole lot of innocent man, men on his way to get to me. But David says none of those things. He says my sin runs deep, and God's grace runs deeper. Now, here's why this is so important. And I've kind of said this already. I want to say it one more time, one more, a little clearer. As much guilt as you admit will be as much grace as you can experience. Let me say that one more time. As much guilt as you can admit will be as much grace as you can experience. A few months ago, I broke my wrist. Y'all remember that? I fell off one of those scooters. I broke my wrist, but as I fell, I also got some cuts and some bruises, and I was bleeding a little bit from my arms, etc. I went to urgent care that day. You could not see that my wrist was broken. There was no bone sticking out, but it was broken. What if I had gone in there to the doctor, to the physician, and said, I'm hurting. And they said, what's wrong? And I said, well, I've got some cuts and bruises. What would they have done? They would have bandaged me up, put some balm on there, put some Band-Aids on there, and sent me out. And I could have walked out of that doctor's office with my wrist still untreated. That's what so many of you do with God. He is the physician of your souls. He is there to deal with what's actually broken in you. But you bring him your cuts and your bruises. And you say, I've got these little things wrong with me. I've got these little things wrong that I've done. And you know what God does? When you bring him just that little bit of guilt, he brings you just that little bit of forgiveness. And he puts some Band-Aids on there and he cleanses those things. But you walk out of there with the bone still broken. Now God knows. Thank you, Kimberly. God knows it's broken, but repentance requires you to own it. You, ca you can't expect God to forgive you for something you haven't asked forgiveness for. Now, I believe if you've placed your faith in Jesus, he does forgive you of all your sin, past, present, and future. I'm not saying if you don't remember to repent of every little thing, then he's not going to forgive you for that sin. But I am saying you will not experience grace until you are able to come before God and say, my sin runs deep. But God, your grace runs deeper. Y'all got to kill somebody named Jed. This is another one we all learned from Kimberly. I, she didn't make this up, I don't think. But she got this from somewhere, and I've been saying it, and I've saying it to other people. Jed is a guy who lives in your head. Jed stands for justify, explain, defend. If you had known what he was doing to me, if you had known what she was doing to me, if you had known the temptation, if you had known what my dad did to me, if you had known what my mom did to me, you would understand blah, 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 blah. You got to kill Jed dead and say Jed is dead. I will not justify. I will not explain. I will defend. That's not saying it was all your fault. That's not saying it was all your fault, but you got to own the part you can own. You got to say, my sin runs deep if you ever want to experience the depth of the grace of God. If you know the end of this story, it's a little tricky because David actually did not receive the full grace of God. He shortly after had that child with Bathsheba. And he... God looked into the situation, and you may think this is not fair and not right, and I understand that. But God said, for that rape and that murder, I am going to require the sacrifice of David's son. And David's son died. 
as a punishment for David's sin. The wrath of God was poured out on David's family for the rape and the murder. David asked for grace, and he did not receive grace. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that to say we live in a different era of history than David did. God required the sacrifice of David's son for David's sin. God sacrificed his own son for your sin. Do you see? When David came to God asking for grace, he really didn't know if he was going to receive it or not. And he didn't. He did not receive the grace of God. But when you come to God asking for grace, you can be confident that the weight of your sin has already been paid for. There is punishment deserved for what you've done. But all of that punishment was put on Jesus, God's own son. Someone should die for all that we've done. But someone did die already. God sent his one and only son into the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That means even if you are in the darkest valley right now, from your own bad decisions, if you have put your faith in Jesus, there is no punishment for you. There is no wrath left for you. God may discipline you. He may put you through a trial. There may be some natural consequences, but there is no wrath for you. There is nothing you've done. There's nothing you could do. There's nothing you will do that is not already paid for by the blood of God's own son, Jesus. When you come to God even more than David, you can come saying, yep, I'm just going to admit my sin runs deep, but God's grace runs deeper. Amen? Amen. When you're in the valley, that's how you start. You say, my sin runs deep, God's grace runs deeper. But that's just the beginning. We're going to do these two a little bit quicker than say, but don't tune out because this is so, so, so important. Coming to God, asking for forgiveness, knowing you've been forgiven is the beginning, but not the end of actually walking out of the valley that you got yourself into. Look what David prays next. He says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. This is just David basically repeating what he's already said. God, forgive me, free me, cleanse me, purify me. But then he asked for something new. Something that a lot of us don't have the guts to ask God for. Look what he says. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. He believes that even though he's done the worst, he's done evil in the sight of God, against God and God only, he sinned. He says, I want to be so confident of forgiveness that I am filled with joy. Isn't that hard to pray for? It's hard to ask that. I know I've done wrong and I know I can be forgiven, but my greatest hope after being forgiven is just kind of walking away like this. Okay, God, thanks for forgiving me but I'm still kind of mad at myself. I still don't really forgive myself. David says, no, 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 no. I want joy. He says, I, I went down the wrong path, but as I go down the right path, give me a joyful start. So many of you get caught in the valley because when you start going down the right path, you start going in the right path with guilt. You start going down the right path with shame. You start going the right you start going down the right path, still beating yourself up and sh heaping shame on yourself. David says, no, 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 no. I need a joyful start, knowing I've been forgiven. And after God took the sacrifice of David's son, he wa David was completely forgiven. Thanks be to God that we can be confident that we are completely forgiven as soon as we start taking that step. And not because of the step, but because of the cross. But that's not all. He prays for. He goes on. He says, hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. Again, saying, cleanse me, purify me, etc." And then he says this. Create in me a, everyone say that. Pure heart. Pure heart, oh God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. He says, I need something new beat, beat, beating in my chest. He says, give me a joyful start 
and a pure heart. He puts these two things together at the two verses later and says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, which is that joy part, and grant me a willing spirit, which is basically a description, again, of a pure heart. He says, I need joy and I need a pure heart. I need a joyful start and a pure heart. Which of those is harder for you right now today? As you think about what you've done or how you got to where you are, which is harder for you? Is it harder to walk with joy knowing that you've been forgiven? Are you the kind of person who beats yourself up? Oh, I'm the worst. I'm, I'm so filled with guilt and shame, blah, 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 blah. Or is it harder to begin the journey with a pure heart, saying, I hate what I did. I don't hate myself, but I hate what I did, and I have a heart that desires something new. Here's why this is so important. If you have neither, you will not get very far walking out of that valley. Let me go in the valley right now. Let me get out of the light into the dark. What's up, friends? So close, so close. Hey, this is the valley, right? This is in the dark. I can actually see you guys because the lights aren't in my face. Great to see you all. Welcome to the bridge. Love you, James. When... We start that journey. Okay, I got myself into the valley. I'm a mess. If we got no joy, I'm the worst. I'm so filled with guilt. And we're like, and I still really miss doing that thing. We get like two steps before we are right back. We go straight back into that thing. No, 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 no. Some of us, though, we think a pure heart is enough. We think, I got in this valley and I understand that what I did was wrong. And I hate my sin, but I think it's good or fine or maybe even better to beat myself up as I walk out. God, I did wrong, and I hate what I did, and I'm the worst. I'm a sinner. I got no joy because I know that I'm the worst person ever. If you do that, sooner or later you'll go, this feels terrible. You know what felt better? Doing that thing I was doing before. And you stroll right on back into the same place that you were before. A pure heart, according to David, is not all that we should pray for. Some of us, though, think just the joy is enough. Some of you all do this. Let me go to this other valley. Some of you all get in the valley and you go, oh, I messed up. God, thanks for grace. Isn't grace good? I'm so glad to be free of the consequences of my sin. I still really like doing it, though. But I'll try going down the path for a little bit. But, man, that sin tasted good. That sin tasted sweet. And so I think because I know I'm going to be forgiven anyways, I'm going to go hang out in the valley for a little more. Don't we do that? We do that, too. You need both. You need a joyful start and a pure heart. you got to say, okay, I am in the valley because of my own fault, because of my own consequences, but my sin is covered by the blood of Jesus shed on my behalf. God sees me as his perfect son or daughter. There is no shame. There is no condemnation. I'm totally perfect in God's sight, and I can have joy. And I hate that sin. I don't want to do it again. God put a heart in me that desires something else, something better. We're drawn to the joy of walking with Jesus, and we can walk and walk and walk and walk and walk into a new life. Amen? This is God's will for you. He doesn't, walk, he doesn't want you walking out of that valley covered in guilt and shame. And he doesn't want you walking out of that valley going, man, I still miss the old life. No, you can ask for a new heart. Real quick, let me say this. We live in a culture that says, listen to your heart. You know that song? Remember that song? When it's calling for you, listen to your heart. Thank you. Your heart got you into the valley you're in. It was listening to your heart that brought you to the place that you are. Your heart is directionally challenged. You got to understand that. Your heart doesn't know up from down. It doesn't know left from right until you say, God, give me a pure heart, and I'll be able to listen to the leading of your Holy Spirit. Me and my wife, Joanna, go to um, Moonrise Donuts, Every single weekend. Isn't Moonrise good? Mm. 
I am directionally challenged. I've always been this way. Some of you are like, oh, so you're bad at directions? I'm like, no. God, like, let something get real broken in my head. I was bad. Um, I'm bad in Kentucky. I've been here a year and a half. But I was just as bad in Madison when I was there four years. I was just as bad when I grew up in Chicago. I cannot get from point A to point B. And I know a lot of you men are judging me right now. And I get it. I receive that. I receive it. We men, we should be good at directions. I'm bad. I cannot get from here to there without using the GPS. If I were to get in the car, I think we went on Friday, right, or Thursday? Maybe we went on Thursday. We went on Thursday to Moonrise Donuts. If I had gotten in the car and I said, babe, tonight I'm going to follow my heart to Moonrise Donuts, she would have said, oh, but I was really in the mood for eating donuts. And you ain't never going to get there if you follow your heart. You need that GPS to get you there. That's the attitude you all got to take when it comes to making decisions. If you are in a valley or if you got into a valley, it is because your heart led you into it. And you got to ask for God to surgically implant a new heart. He literally says, create in me a pure heart, meaning it's a foreign object getting planted in there. And as Christians, that goes all the smoother because his spirit comes and lives inside us. His spirit guides us. We are given a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. When you are in a valley, especially if it's your own fault, you start out by saying, my sin runs deep. I'm not going to downplay it. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to avoid it. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to explain it. I'm not going to defend it. My sin runs deep, but thanks be to God, your grace runs deeper. Then we pray for a joyful start and a pure heart. Some of that's going to look like making some amends with some people. Not just apologizing to God, but reaching out to some people and saying, hey, I blew it. And part of this was your fault, but part of this was my fault. And I remember our theme? I can't control he, I can't control she, I can't control we, I can only control... I can only control me. I can only control what I did in the situation. And I'm coming and I'm repenting and I'm apologizing and I'm owning what I can own. That's some of what looks like starting over with a joyful start and a pure heart. Lastly, what do we do real quick to finish? Here's what David says to do. This is how he ends. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Let me read that one more time. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. He says, God, I blew it. I blew it. But if you can get me back onto solid ground, if you can get me back onto the high ground, I promise you I will spend my life pulling people out of the valley and putting them on the mountaintop. I will look for other people who are doing the things I just did who are murderers, who have taken advantage of people, I'm going to go to them and I'm going to turn them from their ways. I'm going to help them walk out of the thing that you are helping me walk out of. David says, here's what we got to do. we got to say, I will use this valley to bring someone to a mountaintop. Can I get an amen? Here's the deal. Whatever you have overcome, you now have the recipe for. You've got a redemption recipe. I cannot cook worth a lick. I can't cook anything. If you said make a pot roast, I'd say I'm just going to give up. I'm going to go lay down because I can't do that. I can't cook. I can't do any of that stuff. But let me tell you this. I can make, from all my years of being single, an amazing grilled ham and cheese sandwich. I can walk you through that recipe by heart because I've been there. I've spread the butter. (laughs) I've... I've grilled the ham. you got to grill the ham separate from the sandwich. You grill the ham, then you make the sandwich, then you put the ham on the not yet heated bread, then you grill the whole thing, then you put it in a little blue cheese dressing. Mm. I got that recipe because I've lived that recipe. If you've walked out of something, you know the recipe for how to walk out of that. Better than I do. If it's not so, There's a couple recipes I know real well. When it comes to sin, let me tell you, I've walked out of some things. But there are some things I haven't lived the recipe for. But some of you have. And you could help somebody walk through the thing you're walking out of today much better than me. 
because you've walked out of it. One of the things I love about the bridge is you go in the lobby and everybody's so happy, everybody's so joyful, everybody looks like they've never done a bad thing in their life. But you talk, someone's literally laughing already. You talk to them and they'll say, oh man, I love Jesus and I used to be a drug dealer. Oh man, I love Jesus and I used to be a prostitute. Oh man, I love Jesus and I used to be a stripper. Oh man, I love Jesus and I used to be um, an addict. Oh man, I love Jesus and I used to have a sexual addiction. Whatever it is, there's so many people walking around with recipes and using those recipes, making them rain, helping other people walk out of the struggles that they're in. And today, if you are in that valley, what if you said, I'm learning the recipe for redemption? I'm learning what it's going to take to walk out of this. And as soon as I learn it, I'm going to commit to God. I will use this valley to bring somebody to a mountaintop. And I got an amen. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. If you're in that valley that you got yourself into, you say, my sin runs deep. God's grace runs deeper. You pray, give me a joyful start and a pure heart. And what do you do? You say, I will use this valley to bring someone else to a mountaintop. I relapsed. But I'm going to be able to teach somebody else how to get back up after the fifth or sixth or seventh relapse. My marriage is falling apart. I'm going to fight against all odds to put this thing back together. And someday I'm going to be able to help some young couple put their marriage back together. I'm going to be able to help my kids put their marriage back together. I'm deep in debt. But I believe God can get me out of this financial debt. And then I'm going to help somebody in that valley of debt. Find the mountaintop of financial freedom. I'm going to learn the recipe. Last, final thing, too close. Stupid practical. Here's what some of y'all need to do today. You need to go on our website, thebridgenky.com. Look at this super goofy picture of our worship leader. How dramatic. How dramatic of a picture of Pastor Aaron is this? And it got the word right over his eyes, too. I don't know. You got to go on the website. On your phone or online, and you got to click these two little lines up here. You see them? Put a little yellow circle around them. Then you go in here, and you just look around. You look around, and you say, hey, I wonder what ministries the bridge has. And you say, oh, look at this. They've got outreach. And then you go in there, and you see, we've got Celebrate Recovery. We've got a ministry to help you overcome whatever addiction you're stuck in. And if you're like, well, I'm not really stuck right now, but i got a recipe I can pass on, well, go to serve. Sign up somewhere where you can help somebody walk out of the thing that you walked out of years ago. Sunday morning worship, preaching, all that is not enough. It is not enough to help people walk out of it. Hopefully it's a catalyst. Hopefully it's a big open door. But if you want to get free or you want to help other people get free, you got to get one layer deeper into this whole Jesus thing. You go back to the previous page. You go, oh, I'm going to join a group. I'm going to click on groups. What's in there? Oh, you can sign up for a group. That's right. You can sign up for a group. You can get in the trenches with other people. Normally, we just have group signups like um, in three times throughout the year. We're still doing that for connect groups. But a life group where you go real deep with people, you work through stuff, you journey through life together, you can sign up for that any time. You sign up for a life group. Get yourself into community. Amen. That's not a cool application. There was not like a rah-rah, we all applause at the end. Because the reality is, this is what will make the difference. Getting plugged in, getting involved, not just hearing this and going, sounds good, but saying, I can't say or pray or do alone. i got to say or pray or do with other people. Stand up on your feet. Stand up, stand up, stand up. God, thank you for everybody in here. We love you, Lord. If you are here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, everything I just talked about, forgiveness, salvation, if you have not said yes to a relationship with Jesus, you have no confidence before God. You have not yet been forgiven. He longs to forgive you. He loves you. He paid the price for you to be forgiven. But you have to say yes to that yourself. So I want to give you an opportunity today to begin a relationship with God. To say, I've been living for myself and I want to live for you, God. I've been my own boss. God, I want you to be my boss. I've done some things wrong. I want to start doing some things right. When you hand your life over to God, He forgives you of all your sin, every mistake, every failure. 
past, present, and future. You're going to mess up again after you begin a relationship with Jesus, and all of those failures will be covered by his grace and love. He will adopt you into his family. He will call you his child. He will write your name in the book of life. He loves you so much, he sacrificed his son for you. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you the opportunity to say you want to start a relationship with Jesus today. I'm going to invite you in just a minute to put your hand in the air. I'm not going to make you come up on stage. I'm not going to have people look at you. But when you put your hand in the air, it's a way of you signaling to God, I'm in. I'm in. I want this. So if you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. If you put your hand in the air, and I think I saw at least one. It's hard to see with these lights sometimes. If you just raised your hand, prayer team, come on down. You can sneak out after the service. I will not run you down. I will not find you. No one will seek you out, and no one even saw that you raised your hand. But you have to actually talk to somebody and figure out what this looks like. This prayer team is here to help you take your first steps on your spiritual journey, to help you understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to help you plug in if you are ready for that. And you can pick whichever one of them looks nicest. You can talk to whichever one of them you want. So after we dismiss, if you raised your hand, I want you to come down and someone down here will help you begin that relationship with Jesus. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We surrender ourselves to you each and every day. We thank you that your love for us is like no other love. In Jesus' name, everybody said... We will see you next week for the conclusion of Through the Valley. Have a great day. God bless.